Hello and welcome to Jim Herald's Campfire. Not really. This is the Fortean News Podcast, Confessions of a Ghost Boy, Halloween special with the listeners' stories. If you want to listen to this as a podcast, be sure to tune in, stream it wherever you get your podcasts. And until next time, happy Halloween. So, Chris, welcome to the Fortean News Podcast, all the way from Seattle. Um, you've got a story about sleep paralysis and how that has affected you. I'm excited to hear it. I do indeed. And I'm happy to be here, James. How are you doing? You had a, a, I'm doing good. I'm doing a good. big party yesterday. Yeah, we did. We went all out. Crazy Halloween party. Lots of animatronics. Um, a life-size jack-in-the-box that I built. Uh, you know, complete with... Uh, uh, an EMF uh, re uh, frequency uh, detector for a ghost hunt in the, the crawl space of our house. We went all out and it was super fun for sure. It sounds absolutely amazing. We, we also, I didn't, uh, we, we had, uh, I had confetti cannons and so I, I would like the stuff in my pockets and I would lead people, you know, like poppers, like bangers. And I, I would like, lead people down stairs and they were like spooked because i of course like got all the light bulbs out and they were just had a flashlight and the the uh emf thing and like i would like shuttle them into this unfinished crawl space and then like every time they like cross the threshold i would like pull the banger and just like slam the door behind them <laughs> and they're just classic fun time that sounds amazing my dream friday night <laughs> Dude, someday you'll have to come and, and do one of the Halloween parties. That would be so fun, dude, if you came for like uh spooky season to Seattle. We could like definitely need box. to. Yeah. The, the guy from uh, the Bothell Hell House keeps saying to come over. I don't know if you're Which, familiar with that. Uh, oh, a, wait a second. Wait, yeah. someone, wait, you're telling me that se like, like a listener or, or someone that I assume he listens, he, he, he messaged me on social media. And um, but it's like really cryptic mess, cryptic mess, not cryptid, cryptic messages, but about coming over and seeing the house in Buffalo. That's where so there was weird. The Buffalo house, house is oh my god, that is so strange. That's like this. Um, you know, I grew up in Buffalo. Uh, yeah, it's like this legend. There's like a few, you know, like haunted spots like the uh but the yeah that like I mean I remember I think that that's the Bothell Hell House. There was like this portal to hell or whatever like on that property is that what is that what they were mentioning yeah 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 so funny god kevin and i uh my best friend kevin who's also you you're well he's been on the show too. yeah yeah uh yeah that's right yeah he, him and i you would walk by that property constantly as children um that's funny that's so wild yeah he, 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 I, I invited him on the show and then he just sends me like a picture of a burnt book and that's kind of like how the conversation's going. I'll like, <laughs> I'll do an invite out or a call out, and then he'll he'll message back, and then I'll try and arrange something, and he'll just send me a picture of something. So if you're listening, like let's <laughs> let's arrange something. Weird. Maybe it's not even a person. Yeah, it could be the poltergeist itself. It's it won't be the first time. In. It's trying to pull you into the portal, man. Yeah, that's where I came from. I was exactly. born. <laughs> it's going back. It's back to the motherland. <laughs> I love it. So, yeah, sleep paralysis. So I've only, I've only yeah. ever had sleep paralysis once, and yeah. um, did you? See thankfully, stuff? no. It was. I was having a, a a fibro flare up. I was in pain, and then there was something going. If you let me in, the pain will stop. But I was like, okay, I'm dreaming, and that was the end of it. But. It was it was still terrifying. So you were very conscious that you were still dreaming, like or, uh, yeah, I I assume because I was in I had a really bad flare up, so I was in a lot of pain. So I maybe went in that hypnagogic state, but the pain like brought me out very quickly. Okay. So then I was still had that kind of subconscious still within that. That's how I okay. interpreted it. Interesting. Um. Yeah, so I have sleep paralysis, you know, I mean, I've I've had it since, I mean, for, I would say, probably about 
10 years now and it used to be a frequency of when it first started and I'll, I'll give you the origin story it's pretty fucking weird um i mean it re i was just going through my notes um like i i, I went on a vox like podcast to tell my my sleep paralysis story like a few years ago and and you know i gathered up i every time i have sleep paralysis kevin uh, i would i would um sorry my brain like you know i have add too so i'm like every time i start saying a sentence i think of like three other things yeah. so apologies for that but um I, I have extensive notes of each time i've had sleep paralysis and uh kevin and i used to trade back and forth because he had it too um but I was just reviewing all of my notes and like talking to my fiance and I was like, this is literally like a horror movie. I mean, it's, there are, it's, it's, there are so many experiences, each one different and, and vivid and insane. Um, it's like hard to believe, like I, they're so crazy. It's hard to believe that it's not like a writer writing them or like, um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's interesting. The hypnagogic and hypnopompic hallucinations, I'm sure you're familiar with, right? Like, mm. yeah. Um, so yeah, should I just rip on the story? Yeah, tell, tell me. Okay, so I had never had experienced sleep paralysis. Um, I had heard about it from various people. Um, and my experience, you know, started and stopped with hearing about it and being like, whoa, that sounds wild right and um okay so i had been out of the country from 2000 i think 2007 through 2000 2008 so there was a, a year where i went overseas and was living on a, on a little outer island in the marshall islands um and I was teaching like music and um, uh, like comparative governments. I it, it, just teaching at this little boarding school on this outer island. And um, I came back to the States, came back to Seattle. And I met this girl that I was hanging out with. Um, we had known each other for about maybe a month maybe even less than that and she wanted to she had never done a ouija board i had never done a ouija board she had a friend who was very like active with them and got results for yeah. lack of a better term um and she was like yeah my you know my friend does this like i'm super curious i want to do it and you know my brain was like it's funny because my my parents like more so than anything else were like never fuck with a Ouija board and it's funny because they're not particularly like they're they're pretty straight laced when it comes to like stuff like that like beliefs and and um you know they're not super like uh woo woo or like you know at all in fact my dad is like really skeptic you know skeptic and uh, anyways, but they, they did always impress that upon me. And I, and I, you know, I, that kind of like rant pinged in my head. I was like, huh, but you know, also I'm like, fuck it. Why? Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I am curious. Like, so we get together. And so again, to recap, I barely know the, the first girl and I don't know the second girl at all. We go to, uh, her apartment and she does that kind of opening prayer thing and, asks you know if anyone is there and if anyone wants to talk and then she starts going through each one of us in the room being like oh do you want to talk to so-and-so do you want to talk to me do you want to talk to chris and she's doing that for ever i mean to the point where we and nothing is happening i mean mm. we're going for it's probably like honestly about an hour and a half in and at this point we're just kind of like lazed over the floor like sipping on beers and kind of like having our own conversation but like still holding on to the planchette and like intermittently we would just like call out again you know yeah kind of casually and 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 that's the weird thing is that like all that time later she called out and when she said is there anyone here it 
move to yes. And I'm like, whoa, that that's weird because I, you know, after holding on to this planchette for like over an hour, you get a sense of like when someone accidentally moves it mm -hmm. or when someone purposely moves it, you start like, you can feel it. Like you can feel the different pressure and stuff. And that felt different, like right yeah. out of the gate. So I was like, Oh, that felt different. It like glided. Yeah. 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 Like it, like it just felt like, like the perfect amount of force on all ends or something like, and then she was like, do you want to talk to me? Doesn't move. Do you want to talk to this other girl? Doesn't move. Do you want to talk to Chris? it goes away from yes and then back. And then she's like, okay, ask questions. And, um, I started asking, it's, it's funny because, you know, um, I was, I couldn't think of like stuff to ask. So immediately I just started thinking of like Kevin and mine's childhood because like, it's just, there's, I don't know. It just, that's I I'm, I'm like locked on to that shit. It's like I have a dictionary in my head of all that stuff. So like, I was like, you know, uh, Kevin had a Kevin's family had a cat growing up. Like this beloved cat. Like what was its name? And it spelled C L I M, and then it stopped. The cat's name was Climber. All right. So I'm like, that's like the first one. I was like whoa that's weird but again it didn't spell the whole thing out i'm like okay could have that just been like i mean that's a pretty crazy coincidence and then i was like okay well he had a dog like we had this at the same time as he had the cat he had this dog what was the dog's name p o l dog's name was polo um wow. yeah and then i was like i I, I started feeling this feeling that would like grow through the rest of the night, which is like, I can only describe as like, like an electricity that was like in my chest. Like I started feeling this, like, uh Oh, like something, this is weird. Like, this is how, how is this possible? These girls don't know me mm. anyways. I don't want to uh, drag it on too long. So I'll try to like, just speed it up. Like basically I kept asking questions like that and they all kind of remain. I kind of got stuck in this like Kevin and me centric thing. And every fucking time it would spell out like the first three or four letters of whatever I was like asking. And then it would just kind of like drift. Mm. And um, it got to the point where uh, like another one was, I, I said, um, you know, me and Kevin and his brother um, went on this like pivotal camping, super fun camping trip. It was out at this fort um, on the coast. Like what was the name of the fort? And it said C-A-S and it was Fort Casey. Um, so anyways, after a certain point, I actually got a little bit like scared <laughs> and right. I, I stopped touching the planchette and I moved to the corner of the room and I kept asking questions with like my back in the corner. And so just the girls now have their fingers on the planchette and it's kept going. In fact, went faster. It started like, like no lag. Like as soon as I asked the question, it would spell it out. And the girls were like, kind of like, it was happening so quickly that the girls were like kind of like laughing and like kind of like nervous laughing. And I was just like sinking like against the wall in the back, like kind of feeling horrified. Um, it's, it, it's, if it, it started, if like it blew my fucking skull cap off. Cause I was mm -hmm. like, ow, these girls don't know me. It's this, something is happening. Yeah, it's Something removed. Is fucking happening. You and... you going away and get your hand off it is removed. You are, the potential, like a skeptical, say your subconscious was still moving it. Yeah, that's eliminated exactly. that from the whole equation. Right, and it's so it's going fast. It's going so fast that it's just it's, and then at the end, it um, it basically just went like it started rapid firing uh from goodbye to c it was like goodbye c goodbye c goodbye c goodbye c like just like back and forth on the board and the girls were like kind of like we shit and then it just stopped wow. and uh i like ran out of her apartment i was serious i was like fucking having a panic attack and i like ran out of her apartment 
was like hyperventilating basically and uh the girl who brought the ouija board like came outside and just kind of like blew past me and was like i'm sorry or something and i was like okay but and she like drove off and i came back in the apartment and the other girl was like what happened and i was like i have no fucking what did happen like what the hell what and i remember just lying in bed like my neurons just like i was like how how did that ha like what how did that and then that that like electricity feeling in my body and i was just because that is the one time on this planet that like something had happened that i was just i was like i can't figure it out like mm -hmm. it doesn't make sense yeah. how did that fucking and i also felt and this could be just this part could be just be you know my own making but like it felt like a live wire or something like i felt like like the room like change or yeah something. yeah like you know what i mean like definitely felt, yeah like, yeah yeah we, we did and, an investigation uh, recently and and we, we we knew that like all night there was not going to be anything because we just went in and there was sense there's nothing here and then other yeah. times you can feel it and it, and it'll sound crazy to people that are skeptics but you can feel something dip and rise in the room or in the building or even like a woods and then activity occurs when you kind of at that peak there is something definitely an energy that that feeds whatever it is that is doing this interaction so this happens to me. I tell my parents, <laughs> I, I told my parents about it. They were like, I, and I was like fucking, you know, I was like drunk with the experience, like telling my dad, I was like, this fucking happened. Like, this is insane. Like, it, and he was like, his reaction to it was, he was like, don't talk about it. Like, don't tell people about it. Don't tell Kevin about it. Like, cause he knew I would like want to tell Kevin and he was like just fucking because and i was like really struggling because i'm like people are gonna fucking think i'm like it's gonna be i i, I felt like even kevin might have been like really bad but like i he my dad was like very strongly like just stop thinking about it and just push it out of your head don't talk about it blah blah and i did it's like probably the only time in my life that i've i've like literally like on purpose uh uh willingly forgot about something mm. and fast forward to about i don't know six years later six or seven years later i'm now working at this employment law firm as a like side gig um i'm like touring and playing playing music putting out records touring on them but my like day job is at this law firm downtown seattle and i'm the the day is closing up people are leaving the office i'm like checking email and, and then i'm like circling the web for a second and i see um that this yahoo news thing comes up and it's about a Ouija board, someone on trial for something saying that a Ouija board made them do it. And I, that op cracked open my memory. I was like, oh my God. And I like, rem I just remembered and I, I emailed the girl whose apartment I was at right then and there. I messaged her and was like, hey, do you remember this? And she was like, fuck yeah, I remember. Like immediately wrote back and was like, fuck yeah, I remember. So one of the weirdest nights of my life or something. And, um, then I start that night at my office looking up forums for skeptics that have had Ouija board experiences. I wanted to like, <laughs> I just needed some kind of like group. I, you know, I was like, I wanted to read at people who, who are like me, who have, who don't necessarily believe, but have had an experience that they're like, I can't deny mm -hmm. this. And so I start reading these forums and soaking it in and it's blowing my mind and then i have to leave work and i have a band practice back at back at our house up here in queen anne this old house i'm in now um and that is the first time at that rehearsal that i told people about the ouija board experience i told my band i was like i guys i just remembered this insane thing that happened i tell them the whole story they're like well that's that's weird that's spooky and practice ends 
they all pack up, they go home. I brush my teeth. I'm getting ready for bed. Um, at the time, feel like environmentally, it's kind of important to know the layout of how this happens. Like at the time I was living, um, upstairs, second level, um, second story of this house in a room that like you walk into the room and there's like the main part of the room windows to the outside. And then there's like an Alice in Wonderland door to like a walk-in closet. And then that's where my mattress was. It was like super punk, you know, like super yeah. punk rock. Uh, and that's where I slept. So on the other side of the Alice in Wonderland door was the rest of my bedroom. Um, and I go into bed and I shut that Alice in Wonderland door and I'm lying in bed and I'm just kind of like lying on my back thinking. And then suddenly I get this feeling like a panic attack starts coming like really quick though. So I get like the, just in my chest, I'm like, but something's wrong like and within like five seconds i heard what sounded like the windows on the second story on the other side of that door fly open like it sounded like they just like got rocked on their hinges and then something boom solid hit the floor so like it sounded literally like something swung the window open and just jumped into the room on the second story and then I heard like doo -doo 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 -doo, up to that little door. And right as it got there, I felt this like hammer punch on my chest. And I like lurched up in bed, just like, oh. and I had from that night on, I had like sleep paralysis every night for like four months. Wow. And, and I've had sleep paralysis ever since. Um, it's way less uh now i get it like twice a month but at first it was every night and it got to the point then where i was like afraid that i was gonna have to like get admitted to like a psych ward because i was i had heard about sleep paralysis but i wasn't familiar very familiar and i was like i am being like oppressed by something like I, I and I was like this is uh, now every horror movie I've ever seen like this is like like the lines are blurred I uh, l literally I was just like this is happening to me and it, and it I was like afraid to go home from work I would like mm -hmm. stay late and then sometimes like I would be alone in the office and I would like feel it there like I would walk through it, it was weird man like I would walk through the threshold of the door and I could like feel it i was like oh shit it was like this just dark like oppressive dirty for lack of a better term sexy no just kidding um yeah i don't know it, it but yeah so that's that's where it started and um it's been with me ever since and I'll, i'm glad to i'll i'll share share with you what it's like for me because it's extremely vivid and i have um like longer early hypnagogic hallucinations. So like not even when I'm in bed, but I'll, I'll hear stuff sometimes when I'm just getting ready for bed, like mm. I'll get like oral or oral hallucinations, um, sounds I'll hear. And then I'll be like, Oh shit, I'm probably gonna have sleep paralysis tonight because, um, but yeah, the, the hallucination aspect of it is like really high and, and oppressive on my end. Like, um, and just the most horrible uh i mean it's like very imaginative and honestly it's giving me a lot of ideas for like film stuff um but it's like it always finds new ways to like fuck me up like i i i'll think and i'll even tell people actually fuck, sorry man i go off on tangents here but um it fine i feel like it's like semi-intelligent like just last week or two weeks ago, I was telling someone, having a conversation with them about sleep paralysis. And I was telling them like that it doesn't really scare me anymore. I've had it so much that um that I know what to expect and it and and it's it's just kind of cool when it happens. And then that night I got rocked by such a fucking hard one that like I was like shook. And and in that one, I'll just give you a brief synopsis of what, what yeah. that was. So I have a, I have a dog, uh, like an adorable uh, 
uh, black lab slash pit bull. Um, she's the best dog in the whole world. So cool. Um, she like has this sleep schedule where she, um, she doesn't sleep on the bed with us, but in the morning when she wakes up, she like, we let her on the bed to like snuggle for an hour or something anyways. Um, but that so she sleeps on a little dog bed by her bed. And, um, so I'm, I was having a nightmare that night and, um, I, in the nightmare, this thing like latched onto my legs and was like biting, like fucking biting my legs, like ferociously in a dark room. And I woke up into, into sleep paralysis. Right. And the, and I could feel the thing biting my legs still. And I was like, it like crossed over it fucking it's here. Right. And I reached down and I grabbed its mouth and I fucking pried its, I like broke its jaws open. And then the body went fucking limp on my legs. And I realized, Oh my God, I just murdered my dog. But like, it was all just a fucking hallucination. It didn't really happen. So you were, are you able to move when it's happening? Sometimes, sometimes. Um, like that time I was literally like crying. Like, that's unusual, like, isn't it? Like miming that. Yeah. I mean, dude, it, it my sleep paralysis is, is really fucking weird. Like I will wake up um, out of it, like doing um like being in positions like where I'm like reaching up towards the ceiling. Um, dude, one time I woke up into like this, like thing where I was reaching towards the ceiling and I look, I like woke up like being like, Oh, what? And I look over and Ayla was doing it too, asleep. Also like reaching up. Oh, shit. And I was like, what the fuck are we doing? And she was like, she like woke up and was just, dude, it was, it's, I don't know. That, that's something, yeah, that's beyond, that's paranormal because it's beyond the normal scientific explanation Dude, of sleep it's... paralysis. Yeah, I don't know. Um, but yeah, most times I can't move um, and I'm like the thing, whatever hallucination it is, like another good example would be like, um, I pulled up all these things I was reading just before this, this call, but um, like a good example would be like, Oh, I have two really fun ones. Um, so a recent one, another recent one, or like a year or so ago was I, they're always, they're most commonly precipitated by like extremely horrifying, seemingly, seemingly like sentient nightmares. By that, I mean, like, it's not just a bad dream where bad stuff is happening. Like something comes to me in the dream and points makes it lucid by coming up to me and being like hey you're dreaming like they like pointed out to me and i'm like oh but then they're like the agent of chaos like they make like they it's hard to explain i but there's like always like a sentient like person or character in the dream that like is like looks at me and i see like intelligence in their eyes and i'm like oh oh jesus this is a dream this is a nightmare this is about to be you know and uh um so the the most recent ones that or uh, like a good examples are like i woke up out of this um yeah horrible so it will, it will be this horrible fucking thing that happens and often like there'll be a false waking are you familiar with that no so if I have, dude, I have like the mother load of sleep paralysis. So I have, you know, hypnagogic, hypnopompic hallucinations and false waking and sleep paralysis. False waking is where you are dreaming and then you wake up, like right. you wake up and you're like, holy shit, I just had this dream. Uh, you know, you're telling your partner or whoever and you go about your day and then it turns into a nightmare and then you wake up and you're like, right. oh my God. I just had two fucking dreams and then you start going about your day and then it turns into a nightmare and then it happens like 40 to 50 times and wow. you're like, am I dead? Like yeah. I've literally yeah. had it happen so many times that I was like, oh, I died and I'm like in this like liminal space now 
And this is my fucking life. Like I just am living in this. I, like I've literally thought like been like panicked in the dream and like been like, ah, like squeezing my eyes shut and like just repeatedly like waking up in the dream, in the dream, in the dream. But like to the point where Ayla, a common thing with Ayla and she can attest to this is that when I'm having sleep paralysis and I get out of it, one of the first things I say is I'm like, is this real? Is this real? And she's like, yeah, this is real. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, it's fucking, it's real really weird anyways sorry i keep going off on tangents so a, a couple of good examples though are this one where i woke up and i i couldn't move i was in paralysis came out of this nightmare and i'm like couldn't move in bed and then nothing nothing was happening but i started hearing this drip this dripping noise and i realized it was like it was the bath uh, something down in our bathroom and then i heard like it was like sloshing so i was like oh the there's some someone's in like the bathtub and then I heard it like slosh loudly. And then I heard someone like stand up. So like all this dripping in the water, step out of the bathtub, walk up the stairs. I hear the dripping of the water on the wood. And I'm like, at this point, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like trying to like get out of it. And like, and it fucking, I hear it come all the way up to our fucking bedroom door. And I see the shadows of the feet. Yeah. And then I, and then I break out of it and it's gone. Um, Another one, this one is fucking wild, dude. Um, I had an I was having a nightmare that I was I was um in a house with a girl who was my sister, and we were like it was like Victorian times or something, and I was like a small boy, I was like 10 years old or something in the dream, and we were looking around this dark, creepy house, and I looked and I saw this old chair and this chair slid across the room and like hit me behind the legs. And so it made me sit in it. And then I felt something grab me. And as that happened, this like, this, uh, you know, this ghost, this, this specter, like kind of came into view as this old scary fucking hag woman, um, and she was like clamping me down and I like reached out towards my sister in the dream. And right as I did that, the late, the lady tipped the chair, right. And the chair falls through the floor and suddenly we're falling from the tops of trees in a dark forest at night. The chair hits the ground with her like vice gripped behind me. I can see her fingers here right we hit the bottom of the forest floor and it's just still and i'm like and i'm just waiting for her to like you know like wake up or whatever and anyways i'm on the bottom of the forest floor and my vision blurs and i'm in bed in queen anne and i'm looking at the back of ayla's head and then i fucking look down and her hands and fingers were like a rat still wrapped around my shoulders and i was just like <laughs> <laughs> like you know like fucking freaked the fuck out and then it you know when i broke out of it they went away super weird shit you see i don't know if you know in in europe in medieval europe it was known as old hag syndrome so it's interesting that you've been pinned down by the old hag because oh yeah yeah i'm dude i've read textbooks on right. um i've studied sleep paralysis yeah. because there's not a lot out there and, and i um I've, I've bought, yeah, I mean, I've read so much. I know every cultural archetype I know about the Hmong people. There's, you know, I'm sure you're aware of like the one culture that has actually died from sleep paralysis. No. I, I, you know, yeah, there's actually a culture. There's a group of people, the, the Hmong people, they're like, um, uh, uh, semi-nomadic, um, people that are spread out over like parts of Cambodia and Vietnam and um they have uh they they in the early 80s these um groups of uh refugees were moving to California and when they did that they were separated from you know they they had really tight-knit communities in their their um, where they came from and they had like spiritual practitioners and stuff and sleep paralysis is a massive part of their culture like it is experienced by people uh 
quite commonly, but they view it as, I mean, it's not a good thing. It's like, it's you're yeah. being yeah, uh, yeah. oppressed by something. And anyways, they didn't have the spiritual practitioners in some of these communities that they moved to in California. And anyways, these Hmong refugee, refugees started dying and they don't oh. know, they didn't know why. And they were like finding like coffee machines and shit hidden under their beds and like journals and stuff being like, this thing is like fucking coming for me and I can't get away from it. And, and they died of like cardiac arrest arrest. And um, there was a LA times article about it. And a guy by the name of Wes Craven saw them and wrote nightmare on Elm street. Right. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's scary. Yeah. I know the uh, Vietnamese have a lot of, um, Issues with shadow people as well. As, as I haven't heard that. That's interesting. In oh. America, though, but not not at home. Weird. Yeah. So I don't know if that's linked. What do you think was, or who, or what do you think was the original communication on the Ouija board when it started? Dude, I, I couldn't even venture to. I mean, I don't. It's so funny because, again, as a skeptic, I'm like, as you say that to me, I'm like, shut up, dude. <laughs> like, But like, you know what I mean? But I, if you're asking like, while it was happening, what did, if I had any kind of inclination? No. Um, it didn't, I mean, I, yeah, I have no idea that's that's the the end all be all of it but like of course my brain tried to when i was at since i was asking kevin uh centric questions you know he lost his brother when we were all in our early 20s unexpectedly and like tragically so like of course my brain was like is this scott like i, I but but um Yeah, no, at no point did I ever, I mean, that might have crossed my mind at the beginning, but like once it started like ripping, you know, like actually like really happening, I mm -hmm. I was like, I didn't get a sense that it was like a familiar friend mm -hmm. or something. Yeah. Yeah, this is why I always tell people to be careful because it's, I believe they have access to like the Akasic records where there's all the information. That's what it, dude, it's so funny. I felt like, yeah, that's, that's when I was, I told you, I was like laying there awake in that apartment afterwards, like, and I was trying to, and that's what I told my dad and that, it, when he was like, just forget about it. I was like, I, that's what I, it felt like. It was like some, something just had the knowledge, like had the records and was yeah. just, and was using that to try to gain confidence or like prove yeah. something. Um, but it felt like off. And yeah, I did not like it because we see that a lot in poltergeist cases, don't we? Where they will give information that's absolutely correct, but then maybe like one thing that's ridiculous. It's like they almost have to tell one lie, and maybe like with you, they weren't allowed to finish the words. They could only give you so much of the information, but it was yeah, enough to be such a weird part of it. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's worse or, or like it's funny it, that not finishing the words thing. It's like, it's like almost like an insurance policy to not be um, maybe it's like an insurance policy that like people won't full, can't fully believe you or something. Yeah. You know yeah, I mean? yeah. Yeah. Like, cause, cause they're like, okay. So it wasn't even, you're just like, but I'm like, okay, but it did it like 20 times. Yeah. How, yeah, like, yeah. How I I I'm willing to, you know, accept that maybe that could have happened like two times as a coincidence. But yeah. like spelling the first three or four letters of every question, that I like that's just how is that possible? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. It's too much of a hit, isn't it? But it does sound. It's like it's enough of a. a thing to like make someone who is hearing this this story sound like feel skeptical about it you know and it's like i like the idea that you're saying which is like n n or not even that you're saying but like that like maybe it's 
if there is an intelligence behind it, that that is a purposeful thing to make it um, make you sound less believable if you're like repeating it or something. That's kind of scary, honestly. Yeah, and and I believe a lot of it. Again, I'll, I'll be going into this tomorrow tomorrow night for anyone listening who's coming to my talk. Is it's that personal experience as well. It isn't for anyone else. It's for the person, the experiencer, to gain knowledge and learn from. Um, even to you know the the classic I always tell on this show is where we were in a place with Pollock Ice TV and we were getting them to move this ball and we expected it to maybe like shake a little bit, you know, and then be like, "Cut, that's cool," and it shot from the floor to the ceiling so with such force it hit the ceiling tile off the ceiling and we got it on film but when we looked at it the camera it was on a telephone and the camera had flipped and it was filming our faces and had we been filming the ball I don't think it would have moved because it wasn't for anyone else it was for us in that moment to experience did you guys uh like freak out when that happened yeah, I I don't. I know, I know it sounds like I'm being really blasé. I, I this is this is my my what I do for fun. I love it. And I we were on one investigation once, and we heard a woman sing and scream. And then everyone's running, and I'm looking around, but everyone's running away, and I'm running towards it. So yeah. I, I I I love this stuff. I live for it. Um, but it was exciting. Uh, that, that that place anyway was that building was a really playful feeling. There's some places you go in, and don't get me wrong, like this, like if it's something demonic, which is hence the sleep paralysis, the one thing that I had. If you could pick anything out of my head, it's I'm really careful against what we would term de demonic entities, those really negative things, and that does scare me. But yeah, the poltergeist itself doesn't. It's just, it it just seems to interact. Um, but that place would do stuff for fun and just be really playful. Um, but there was things like, as, as as well, I've told this story before, where there was one room where the the furniture kept being moved overnight, and it was a it was a really tall building. We're talking, I don't know, like thirty forty feet up with the top floor, and the 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 room was all alarmed as well with movement motion apart from like the top floor, so no one could have broke in, and you would have to climb in the the window. And it, and force it open, and it was closed. But the room just kept moving, like the furniture, the bedding pulled up, and um, so I was like, right, we're going to put oh, and and chips, what you call fries, um, would appear under the bed, but no one's been in. This is even like when the building's closed. We put a camera in, a motion camera, so any movement would pick up. Nothing happened all week, and the night I took it out. Like the only thing it picked up was me leaving the room and me coming back in the room a week later. When I took the camera out, it was almost like I had a tantrum and threw the bed upside down across the floor. Weird. So it was like, no, you're not meant to capture this. We'll do it for you so you can experience it. But as soon as you try and prove it, then... And, it, and, and most of our investigations, like, we we go and we set up. And while we're setting up, stuff happens. As soon as we get the cameras rolling, nothing happens. And then we pack down and everything kicks off again. So that's a common you know thing as well. Interesting. Like, I wonder if there's a way this is, I, I don't even know how to articulate this, but like with that in mind, there's a way to capture it without capturing it in a conventional sense. Or like if there's a way to record it without like setting up the like obviously if there's some if it's true and there's some other thing on the other side and they can see everything you're doing you can't like sneakily set up a camera mm -hmm. and be, like hide it from them but like it's almost like i guess there isn't because it's the idea that like if they or if this intelligence knows that you're trying to capture it and they would just by the virtue of like do you like seeing more than we see yeah then there wouldn't be a way to trick it into thinking it's not being recorded i'm just i'm just like thinking like how any human consciousness that has some idea of what it's going to do it's already perceived almost by them whatever they or the entities are 
that the separate consciousness is. It seems to be having all knowledge, but also directly already knows your purpose and thought. Mm, that's really weird. Have you ever done a Ouija board before? Yeah, I did one. I did a really weird night and uh, I don't think I've told this before. So one of the first investigations when I first start going, you know, I need to get some answers to what I was experiencing. Um, and, and someone invited me to a place in Pontefract, which is, um, it's not 30 East Drive, which I have stayed in on my own, um, which is meant to be the most violent poltergeist in the world. So I did that for charity last year, um, stayed all night on my own. But this was a place called the 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 Red Lion. I hear about that. Yeah, that was a crazy night. Um, the Red Lion, and um, and that that's also a really well known pub. And the previous um, landlords had, had, had nailed the door shut, so you could see like they'd pulled all like completely. Like, I mean, like we're talking nail after nail all around the door frame. And um, the new owner went in and he, he total skeptic thought it was nonsense, but then it was um, like, I think he regretted it. Stuff started happening straight away. And so I went with the team in to investigate and they brought this, it's called the Anguished Scream, the Anguished Man, that's it. And it's a painting. And now bearing in mind, I'm a skeptic and I'm, I'm a real skeptic even more for, for, although I believe and I've witnessed everything, I often, a lot of people in the community, I think, particularly when it's paid for events, it's like you've paid and you have to have something happen. So there's a lot of stuff goes on like that. And I, I was really skeptical because there was, this painting was on an easel walking towards me at one point. And like, I, when everyone went out the room, I was like looking for electrics and I didn't find anything. But I'd still, I can't understand how it how it happened. It was too... Wait, the painting was like, like shuffling towards you? Yeah, so we were stood in a circle, right? And everyone was like holding hands. And then there was two people holding the painting on the easel. And if you see this this painting, it's, it's a fe- like... Um, oh, God, that's horrifying. Yeah, and, and what's his name from Star Trek's covered it on his show. And yeah, so this painting has a story behind it anyway. And it's meant to stir st- stuff up. And then when I arrived, there was a couple of mediums and they're like, oh, you've got some energy to me. And they're saying, do you experience stuff? And I was like, yeah, 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 but I'm not done this before, blah, blah, blah. So I don't know whether they were targeting me anyway. But yeah, we were stood in a circle and they, they had their fingers on it. And they were saying, okay, so like lift the left leg up for yes and the right leg up for no. And it was it was responding. It was answering questions and it was kind of going like that. So the easel was lifting up with this painting on. And then, um, and then we're... They were like, do you want to touch the painting? And I was like, I do, because I'm going to touch it so light that they would have to pull it to lift it that way. And, you know, because I'm just going to literally just, just like, that light, I'm touching the mic, it's not even making a noise. And it still did it. So I was like, this is this is odd. And I was looking, there's, there must be like something lifting the leg up. And, um, and then how said, high, right. How high was it lifting up? It was literally, yeah, a good couple of centimetres off the floor, like t- tilting like that, a couple of centimetres off the floor. No, uh, no filament wire? No, no, nothing you, like that. You, you did that? Yeah, when everyone went out, and I was on my own with it for, for a while as well, and there was nothing there. I looked for electrics, I looked for hidden wires. Um, I couldn't find it. I mean, I still think it's a parlor trick. I haven't figured it out. But yeah, they they said, right, we're going upstairs, which is where apparently they they carried out illegal abortions, and it was also a misogynist that ran it in the something like 17th century or something like that. That was the story behind it. And is they said, oh, the painting doesn't like it up there though. I was like, do you want to stay down here? And it, then it said yes. And then it's like, do you want someone to stay with you? Yes. And then it says, who do you want to who do you want to stay with you? And then it, it starts shuffling like that. And then, uh, like, to the point where the person holding its hand came off and it shuffled and just faced directly to me. So I was like, okay, I guess I'm staying downstairs with the painting then. Um, And then when we went upstairs and it was darkness, and again, I don't know if this is tricks, but suddenly start pulling my trousers as well. So, because all the lights were off and it was was, um, a ceiling, like a 
not a ceiling, but a, an attic space. So there was no, like, there was no windows or anything. It was pitch black. So again, it could have been a trick. Um, but the one thing that I really, even more, think was real was that we're doing a Ouija board, but it was with a glass on a table and a light, and the glass was going meant absolutely wild. And I was like... Was it, so wait, wait it, it, was, it wasn't a traditional planchette? No, it was just a, a tumbler, a tumbler glass on a smooth table. That's interesting. And it, it was going wild. And um, and I was really, like, I remember the guy I was with who'd come with me, I was, like, giving him the kind of, like, you know, look of, like, this is this is bullshit. <laughs> you know, this is this is too ridiculous. Um, and then one of them was, like, it's a witch. That, like, this witch spirit follows me and she won't leave me and she's she's hijacked it and all this. And, and then the glass went over it was a big table it went right over to the side where so i was the only person still holding it and then it shot that way and i was like i did not do that like my finger was lightly on the glass and like it was almost out of my reach and then it shot back i was like hang on a minute this is this is strange yeah it was a strange night altogether how long ago was that that was goodness me that would be over a decade or more Ago. Interesting. Yeah. Um, this just uh, reminded me of something kind of interesting. Um, or I just remembered something kind of interesting. The um, my sleep paralysis kind of genesis when that was happening. I unbeknownst to me, that is right also around the same time that Kevin started having. This is a hardcore sleep paralysis for the for, for the first time. Like we both basically wow. got it at the same time, which is really weird. That is weird. Um and he he didn't talk about it for quite some time. It, it actually like scared him so badly that he like didn't like just just did not discuss it or like he didn't want to like give it more power or like think about it more and make it happen more. And so he but later when we were like comparing notes about when it started it pretty much like was right around the same time which is weird yeah so yeah. have you ever visited um a shaman or a medium and said what what do you think just to get an opinion no uh uh i've thought about it but i'm like dude i have such a um it's tricky man like i really love um do you know who the amazing Randy is? Yes. On Instagram. Oh, wait, no. Okay. Uh, no then. <laughs> <laughs> I love how like our culture now is like, oh yeah, yeah, that TikToker, right? <laughs> no, no. He was a uh famous illusionist and magician who like was um I mean, he was part of the old, he was one of the last of the old guard. Um, let me see really quick. Um, so, of course, in, in the UK, if, if you say you're amazing, Randy, it means you're really good and horny. <laughs> okay, so you've got to watch um, An Honest Liar. It's one of the best documentaries ever. Anyways, the amazing Randy was, uh, he was uh, 1928 to 2020. He was a um, famous uh, uh, magician and illusionist, and he ended up devoting most of his life to debunking supernatural claims. And he, but he didn't want, he, he always was, was very um, adamant that he was like, I'm not, trying to just shit on people's beliefs like i am doing this because i want to see i i want to mm. uh, i want to see proof yeah and so he and, and but also with the basis of that, that there are so many charlatans that are like taking yeah, yeah. advantage of people and like he that was like deplorable to him and he wanted like for instance like faith healers and shit like that and like evangelicals who like claim to you know do all this shit to these huge congregations and then get like millions of dollars. And he would literally go in there undercover with a team who were wearing wires and they would like find out how they were doing it and fucking expose them. And, mm. and like people like Yuri Geller who with like the spoon. Yeah, yeah. And stuff, 
he would like set up things where like your yeller would like go on like Carson and then fucking Randy would be hiding backstage and do like a double blind on the shit and make it so that he didn't wasn't using his own gear or like whatever like made it so that or well it would stop the static electricity that would like make something that they were talking about happening anyways i fucking i my brain tends to kind of like I don't know. I, I'm not sure how I feel about the idea of like mediums and stuff. Like I, 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 I have thought about it and just for fun, like, I mean, it would be interesting, I think, to talk to someone. And um, I think my brain tends to be like, I mean, it, it's not so crazy to think that someone might be a little more tapped into like some kind of like collective subconscious or, other you know realm of existence or something like i i can under i i can like stretch my brain enough to to do that but um i'm also like the level that i see a lot of the people operating at and like how they talk i'm like if there is something like beyond this world like i just i have like a hard time being like oh yeah these people are just like talking to you like like I would just imagine that once you like pass through this existence, like whatever's on the other side is more complicated and like in depth and beautiful and, or not even beautiful, but just like so beyond our understanding mm -hmm. that it doesn't make sense that they're like talking to these people who are charging people by the hour. It's like, yeah, you know, you're still participating in capitalism. That's, you know like i don't know it's like fucking it's hard for me to yeah we've we've got a guy here called darren brown and he um he does similar where he he will he's he's a non-medium and he, he he tries to debunk it but he will do readings of people that are, are better than any medium it's like perfect and and he'll also do he'll also persuade people certain things he'll have an envelope and he'll get people to pull things but he's he's actually on the route to the to the theater, there's been certain certain things that he's putting impressions on on them. So they think, yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, cool. I, I'll get I always get hate mail whenever this comes up with mediums because, like you said, people make money as well. Um, even frets once as well, which was interesting. But I thought that's very holy. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I have I have also experienced people that are just like. They're so specific. I've never even met them. Like one guy who on the phone, he he wanted me to do a reading because he wanted just for a review. That's all he wanted. And he, I thought, like, okay. And I, I, you know, as I've said on this show loads of times, so I'm not saying if I haven't said before, most, I think there's, most mediums are either faking, amazing at cold reading, or a little bit, a little bit nuts. Um, but there are some that I've met that are, and they're always autistic as well, interestingly. And it's whether that there's that separate perception. I know with my SPD, sensory perception um, disorder, that I have a higher frequency and different level of perception than neurotypical people. I can sense things. I can even sense, like, going into a room where there's been an argument that day and things like that. So... There, there is that kind of ability, but um, I'll never forget this guy. So I bought these new shoes and I bought them that morning. So they weren't on any social media channels and I checked. And this guy lived in Wales. He'd never actually met me in person. And he is like, oh, you um, you got some new shoes and they're really strange, aren't they? Like orange and camouflage. That's an interesting mix. And you were fixing them and I'd bought them. And I was like, have you got any other pairs? And they were like, no, these are the only ones left. And they were they were damaged, but they were like such a good price and I liked them. So I glued them myself. So I bought them and glued them. And um, and he said, you were gluing those shoes, weren't you? Looking out into a valley. And okay, he could have seen this on social media. It was my ex-girlfriend's house and it was it looked out into a valley with a river below. It's like called Broxa and you, you'd look right down into Troutsdale. So, but that was like so specific to to know that information. Um, That's weird. 
things like that. Yeah. That's pretty weird. Yeah. Interesting. But then yeah, I my argument. Oh, my sorry. argument, sorry, my argument always is I don't think they're speaking to the dead. I believe they're doing what we're talking about before, where some consciousness has an attachment to yeah. all information. Yeah, they're just pulling from like a, a network of right. Yeah. That seems more I mean, it's still like wild to think of, but like yeah that's what i again it almost like i don't know how to explain it but like it almost it feels like almost like disrespectful or something like or just just to be like why would i don't know i just don't like the idea there seems something to be i i guess i get defensive because i feel like there's a little it feels exploitative to tell people that um and and insensitive uh, to be like oh this person i have a direct line of contact to this loved one of yours um and they're available to the you know it's like they'll come through me and give you this message um or give anyone who stops by and asks about you this message. it's like why would they be just waiting for i think they probably are busy or like have something else you know i don't know i'm not sure it's it's a it's a wild mm. thing to wrap your brain around but that has always just felt a little exploitative to me and some people though get so much comfort from that on the, you know the other that's the true the that's true i mean that that's and i would i would think that people also would argue some of those people that are getting the comfort from it like might even argue that they that yeah like be like even if it's not real like i needed that closure or whatever yeah that's that's totally to each their own i guess i'm just speaking from my personal um feelings regarding it um yeah, mm. yeah. it'd be interesting though if you went to two different yeah media yeah. and they came with the same thing that was uh on that yeah. Ouija board if they were like, oh, you are like <laughs> being horribly oppressed by something. Yeah. Like every person I go to is like, yeah, that would be, I almost don't want to go just because <laughs> I'm a little bit afraid that that uh, I don't want someone confirming it. I don't yeah. want it. <laughs> don't Unless they have it. a solution. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, only kind of really good Ouija board story I have is, um, a guy called Rob, and he's he's moved to Indonesia now. But he he got one and was playing with it with a group of friends, and this name came up, and then they didn't recognise the name. But he says, and it was just talking to Rob, and it would it wouldn't tell the others anything. And then it said, and I'm watching and following you. Anyway, he he went well. That's just my friends taking the piss because everything was aimed at me. And I, I'd said, shall we do this Ouija board? So anyway, he went to someone else's house with two other friends who didn't know it was going to happen, didn't know these other people. And the same message came up with the same name. Weird. Yeah. That's fucking weird as hell. Hmm. And wow. the only other one, my granddad. So my granddad is a total non-believer and skeptic. And he... um. He used to work at Massey Ferguson making tractors on the production line. And someone had brought a Ouija board home and he thought it was hilarious because it, it was someone bought a Ouija board inside to the factory going, oh, I need this out the house. So he brought it into work and my granddad thought it was hilarious because it was so daft. And then he, um, he took it home. And then the next night, my mum said it was burn. He was burning it outside and he, he refused to say what had happened no and shit. and he wouldn't tell me when i asked him either he's just like we're not talking about that but uh you don't touch them that's all he said wow yeah dude uh, that just reminded me and i'm sure you gotta wrap up here soon but um yeah. i found out this kind of ties the the my story a, a little interesting bow around it um i i would find out later from my dad why he was so adamant before I ever even used the Ouija board, like him telling me like, don't do that. 
um, he eventually told me this story that happened to him where, and it was, it wasn't using the Ouija board, but he, before I was born was like, um, started getting into just like basic meditation, you know, like to clear his head and, and de-stress or whatever. He's again, he's, that was a shock to me because he's, I'm like, can't picture him. You know, he's like a rock rocker you know like i don't even know if rocker is the right word but you know he's a musician artist fucking but like very like straight laced and smart and um but anyway so he he was doing these these meditation things and he had a a, a person that was like a yogi or someone that was like teaching him how to meditate and while he was he started having this thing happen when he was meditating where he would be blank and then he started seeing at first like the form of a person started breaking through and then it started like the more he was meditating he's that form started like becoming a woman who he was seeing every time and he told his this person this practitioner about it and the guy was like give it a rest for a while like just give it a rest and don't think about that don't think about that form you know and my dad being curious like kind of doubled down on it like he started like thinking about it and picturing her when he was doing it and then she like he started like really seeing her when he was meditating you know and being like just this woman and as the story goes or what he told me it was one day he came home and he went up stairs into their bedroom, into the bathroom, and she was just fucking standing there in the bathroom. And he like said that he felt like his life was in danger when he saw her. Like he right. felt like it was like uh he felt like physical threat. And he like fell, he like jumped out of out of the room and then like peeked his head back in. She was gone. And he was like, that is literally the like the last time he's ever tried doing anything that altered his consciousness or, uh, yeah, that was his life. Wow. That's why he was like, don't fuck around with shit. Yeah. Um, pretty weird. That was going to be my last question was, um, would you, would you meditate and see if you met anything? But that, I guess that answers that. <laughs> <laughs> so Chris, um, just before you go, you you do like amazing videos and music. Where where can people find it all? Oh yeah, yeah. Just go to uh, darkdetails.com. Um that's uh yeah, I'm a director um and a composer and uh yeah, all of the stuff I direct and, and edit is up on darkdetails.com. And I will put the link in the show notes minutes, as well. And then a hundred dollars every additional minute. So. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah. Um, yeah. Check it out. It's, it's fun stuff. And it's, you know, a lot of it's pretty like surreal and dark. And so it's, it's on brand. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Dude, I miss you, man. I'm so glad to, uh, to, to see you and, and talk to you. And it's been awesome. Thanks for having me. Great to see you too. So welcome to the show. We've got Amanda, who lives in the High Peaks, who's got a few spooky stories to tell us. Welcome, Amanda. Well, hello, James. How are you? I'm good. Well, kind of good. A bit poorly, but we're getting there. Hopefully not going to cough all over your stories. So <laughs> what have you got to tell us? Might add to the atmosphere if you do. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a, f a couple, haven't you? Um, including I've one about a, a very old Yeah, dog. Yeah. So shall I start with one from my formative years? Yes, please. So... Yeah, when I was about 12 years old, um, and I was a city gal at this time, so I'd been raised in Manchester, and my dad had kind of always been self-employed, he'd run nightclubs, he was a bit of an entertainer, a bit of a performer. But when he got a bit older, he decided he was going to take it, take it slow. So he bought this pub out in the High Peak. So I was yanked out of the city, taken out to the High Peak, and we moved into this beautiful old 16th century coaching house. Really? called at the time it was called the chinley head in but it's we then changed the name to the old coach house and it's since since we left it was actually sold at auction and went on to be someone's home which is another part of the story i'll tell you later actually um so you know 
for me, a bit of a yank out of, of a different lifestyle, but going out into the hills. And it was a really interesting place to live because it was very serene, very quiet. One of those roads in the middle of the high peak with beautiful scenery. But there was always this kind of spookiness about the, the whole kind of area. If you if you know the high peak, you know, it's got a lot of kind of legends and yeah. you know, it's quite, it's a bit ley liney, a bit liminal. Um and not really sort of had any real experience at that point of any form of haunting or any preconceptions at all. But I do remember jokingly when we went to see the property and we kind of met the landlords that were there before us. My dad had jokingly said, oh, have you got any ghosts to tell us about that we can tell the customers about? And you could see this nervous twitch on the two owners. And, oh, no, 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 it's all just nonsense. It's all just nonsense. They're obviously trying to sell us a pub. Yeah. So no, no preconceptions. We're moving. And it all seems absolutely fine. But the first few weeks we were there, we did a lot of renovation. And then, as I say, I was quite young, um, but I was helping the family because that's what we did. You know, we worked in the pub with my mum and dad and me and mum were bottling up behind the bar. Um, and it was broad daylight. It was a sunny day, beautiful day streaming through the windows. There we are putting the glasses up on the shelves. And I looked up and I saw a little boy. And I wasn't sort of scared at first. I was just a bit like, oh, and I dropped the glass that I was polishing and bottling up with. And my mum went, what's the matter? And when I looked again, he just wasn't there. Right. And she went, like, oh, get over it. And, and, and we just forgot about that. Anyway, a couple of weeks later, we're ready to open and we start trying to recruit people. Um, and we were looking for a cleaner. And so we said, well, who was the cleaner that was here before? Oh, you won't get a cleaner. Well, why won't we get a cleaner? Well, the little boy that's in the bar. <laughs> Right. <laughs> so that's that validation. Kind of validated me, like, yeah. okay so I wasn't just seeing things but what was really interesting about that as time went on we started to get sticky handprints on the windows at like the size of a three-year-old right now this was a pub that wasn't we didn't have children in it wasn't a family pub it was kind yeah. of a restaurant really and we kept cleaning them off and they kept coming back so that was the first kind of hint we had but that wasn't particularly scary because that was, you know, it was, it didn't feel too uncomfortable. But we were there up until me being 16, so probably about four or five years in total. And in that time, things kind of progressed and there was a whole range of different things that happened. And again, kind of got validated because while we were there, um, customers would come in and say things like, oh, you know, um, my uncle used to live here, it used to be a gas station. And we thought it was bonkers. And he used to tell us all these stories. So one of them was about kids running around upstairs and he used to bang this broom handle on the roof and shout at these kids. Well, the funny thing was we could hear the same thing when we were right. downstairs in the kitchen preparing. We could hear footsteps upstairs. Um, and my grandma, who always classed herself as a little bit kind of psychic, she always thought she had the gift. She kept shouting at these kids upstairs. She used to say, oh, I'm not sitting up there while you're all working. These kids are playing bat and ball on the wall. So there was all this this element of children, which, as I say, wasn't wasn't too intimidating. And, and, you know, when I was a kid, I used to go upstairs before the pub would close and I was up there on my own. And I remember one night I'd gone to bed and I'd switched the TV off and I'd gotten myself in bed. The pub was still open downstairs. And I suddenly heard the TV like really, really blaring. And I felt like someone was trying to push me to get out of bed. Right. And it was like this little hand pushing me. And I, and I went and I was like half asleep and half awake. And I wandered in, this, in the front room and just turned it off, and went, shut up. And it all just went still. So there was lots of little things like that. But as time went on, um, there was a few darker things that kind of happened as well. Um. And my dad at the time was kind of working in the UK and working in Spain because he, again, as I said, he was a performer. So he'd go over to Spain and, and perform and he had boats there and he kind of, he ran that side of the business and we kept the pub running. And so a little bit of it, I thought, was this down to my mum being a bit nervous and edgy on her own? But a few darker things started to happen. So um, customers had said they kept seeing a man in one of the rooms thinking there was someone in so we had like different restaurant rooms so you had like tables in different areas and waiting staff and customers would say oh there's someone in the back room and there wouldn't be someone in the back room and we all started to feel a bit un uncomfortable cleaning during the day in the back room or right. setting up for it. it just felt a bit washed and this sort of steadily went on and on and I remember one night I'd come downstairs to turn all the lights on <clears throat> which I'd have been about 14, 15 at the time, so quite nervous anyway. But I heard someone say my name in my ear, and it right. felt like felt like they were laughing a little bit, and it, it just felt un uncomfortable. So that was a little bit scary. Then 
my brother and he'd be my brother's six years older than me so he'd be sort of 18 at the time um he'd felt like he got pushed up the stairs um a few times and then my dad was away my brother had left it was just me and my mum and one night my mum said she heard the downstairs door go and she thought it might be Carl, my brother coming home and she heard footsteps come up the stairs and so she shouts carl is that you there's no reply step step steps across the, the landing and then she felt the bed depressed right. and she felt someone getting next to her and she felt that breath well that was it for her she she'd had enough so she told yeah. me dad no I'm not staying in this pub anymore on my own. Um, and he wouldn't have it. He wouldn't have it at all while we were there because I think it was inconvenient to him that yeah. these things were happening. And so that was the last straw for her. And then another interesting thing happened. We got burgled. Um, and again, this was while my dad was away. But what was really odd about it was it was like the burgles had stopped halfway. So in my room, there was money on the side that I'd earned. There was things upstairs. There was jewellery. And it's like they'd come in, they'd done the downstairs, got the booze, got the fags, got the money. They'd come upstairs and something had startled them. So this right. was while we were out and everything had been left. So I often wonder, <laughs> I love that. Did, our, did our ghost scare the burglars away? That would be so amazing we, uh, CCTV it footage, would wouldn't it? It would. I, well, I wish well, this was back in the early, well, late yeah, 80s. Yeah. Can you imagine? <laughs> Just to burglars. I know I'm nearly 50 now, so this was like, this was a long time ago. I would Fantastic. have loved to have seen the footage. I mean, it was, this. you could write a book on this place. The amount of things that happened, you know, the tape recorders would turn on and off. The cat would attack things that wasn't there. You'd see people in rooms that weren't there. Um, now, what's interesting about this, it sounds like I'm a bit bonkers and that, you know, I never had this happen before or anywhere after to that extent. Yeah. So I lived in an older property after that. So my mum and dad then moved into a really old farm in a little village called Petedale, which was ancient. And that had had a murder in, documented murder. Never a problem there. Mm. Nothing like this. Never got the heebie-jeebies. So there was clearly something about this property. And so many people had had experiences there yeah. before as after us. And the really weird thing was no business ever lasted more than about five years. So it had been... Right. Multiple pubs, coaching houses, petrol stations, because it was on a main road, and nobody had stuck it out for more than five years. Now, my dad always used to say, you know, this place wants to be a house. It just wants to be a home. And he used to say that all the time. So when we left, it actually went up for auction, and somebody bought it, and it's since been a home, and they've never moved. So they've been there right. for 20, 30 years now, and it's never moved. Oh, wow. So that was the pub. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. And if so, if, if anyone's listening and they want to uh, burgle the pub, but want to anonymously uh, tell yeah, the story well, bless them, there happened. are people living there now, so I wouldn't go knocking on their door. But yeah, it's a be it was a beautiful place to live, and it was you know obviously the high peak is absolutely stunning, but it mm. isn't. It's an odd place. Yeah, it does feel rather other, is what I would say. It's one of those places where you you stumble across like stone circles and things just randomly and yeah, burial yeah. grounds a there's bit a like the north yorkshire moors here yeah there's a definite witchiness i mean we've got like dicky o'tunstead the screaming skull all yeah. that kind of stuff up here it, it's a little bit interesting <laughs> yeah uh, but beautiful like you said yeah absolutely gorgeous so um that was my pub story i mean i've got a couple of others if you want them yeah, definitely. I, I just did what, what, with the pub one as well. One thing I thought that was really interesting is when you said that people were even in that one room felt uncomfortable during the day because yeah. I've I've done investigations where people yeah. are quite happy during the day, even in rooms where stuff goes off at night, they can manage it, but at night they won't go you in know it. What, but... James, I it's always annoyed me when you watch these kind of ghost hunting series that they're all in the dark and it's all at mm. night. Every experience I had was during the day, yeah, in broad daylight, and I think. That that adds some credibility in a way because there wasn't any sense of nervousness or anxiety. The only time that was a bit odd was when I got the voice in my ear because that was at night, and I was downstairs as a young girl, kind of switching things on, and it was all very dark. But this was like Saturday afternoon doing the Uvering. You know, yeah. it wasn't, and it was a beautiful place. I mean, don't get me, it wasn't a creepy looking place. It had been modernised, so it wasn't like you had that sense of foreboding. And it was yeah. quite big, given given when it was built as well. The room sizes were quite big. The windows were quite big. It was quite an unusual property. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I mean, the first thing that happened was on a sunny day. Yeah. Beautiful sunny day. And and someone getting in bed with your mum, that must have absolutely terrified oh, her. That was it. That was the nail in the coffin for my mum. I mean, everything else, you know, and I have this, I have this philosophy that, the, you know, the life's for the living. 
you've had your chance. Yeah. <laughs> this is my house now. And, and the other house that I'll tell you about in a minute was a similar sort of attitude to that. People say, why didn't you move? Because I was only paying £600 a month in rent. That's why I wasn't moving. Yeah. It's my house. Um, but that was the last thing for my mum. She was like, no, no more. We need we need to move. And we did. We moved literally within months after that. Wow. And did you find out kind of any history of who the characters that were, that were there might have been? No idea. Now, there was one other interesting thing. So in the room where we used to get that sense of foreboding, there was a church pew that wasn't right. from the property. It was a church pew. And a few people had thought there were people sat on that pew, which is why waitresses used to think there were customers at a table right. because they were sat at this pew. Um, now, we then sold that pew onto another pub down the road and 10, 15 years later, I went in that pub for a meal and noticed the pew was still there. So I did go and ask the owner, I said, have you had anything weird happen? And she was a bit kind of like, I said, anything weird around that chair? And she just went, what? how do you know? And so they, they were, but I never knew who it was, but it was interesting right. that it was a church pew. So I, yeah. I really don't know who it was. It was so old and it had been so many things. Who knows? Yeah. yeah. It was a sandstone property. It had its own water. It was a right. stereotypical place that is likely to kind of catch some yeah, kind yeah. of energy. No idea Amazing. who it was. And pubs in general tend to be. We, we, we had just uh, a couple of weeks ago, Dr. Paul Lee, who's who's done a whole yeah. book, two books now on nothing but haunted pubs. It's yeah. it seems to be a theme, doesn't it? Well, there's a lot of energy, isn't there? I think there's a lot of people coming and going. There's a yeah. lot of either positive or negative energy that goes through those places. Mm. You know, and it, it, what I would say is it got darker as it went along and we weren't we weren't successful there, whereas all my other families, other businesses had been successful. For my dad, he always saw it as a bit of a failure. Right. But every other business that had been there didn't seem to stick. And right. the only people that had been able to stay are the ones that turned it into a house. Right. Maybe it was the uh, the, the, the pew people were... Oh, maybe I think like... the kids might have wanted it to be a home. Yeah. You know, maybe it was yeah, yeah. meant to be a house. So. Yeah. Or just some non non for profit church people or something. Yeah, Who knows? <laughs> something nice. <laughs> Fantastic! That that's an amazing story. Very creepy about the uh, yeah the breath on her getting in bed oh, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean that that yeah that that was I couldn't have coped with that, and I'm glad yeah. she didn't tell me that until after we'd left. Yeah, you know, yeah. Can you imagine if she'd have told me that as a 14 year old girl living there now. <laughs> I mean, I would. Very I brave would be, woman, my mother was. She was. She was a very brave woman. <laughs> I'd love to get in that bed and spend the night and see if anyone. Oh, and no. then tr try and interview <laughs> them. But yeah, and so you've got some more stories. Uh, yeah. So I've got two more that you might be. Well, a couple more. So one comes from my mum and dad from back in the sort of sixties when they were dating. Um, there's another one that's about my youngest son. Um, um, who had some interesting when he was a little boy he did some very interesting things um you, you know I know you've talked about this before neurodivergent children being particularly sensitive um yeah. and there was just some interesting things around Ethan and stuff that he picked up that he shouldn't know and then there was another house that we lived in um which wasn't an old house and this was with my current husband and, and our kids so it was it was it was probably only 10 years ago this um and that was an odd one because I, I don't necessarily know whether it was a haunting or whether it was just that that house had had so many negative things happen in it that there was something else attached to it that didn't feel like a haunting. And you're going to laugh at me now. I would refer to it as a yattering. So some yattering. kind of negative. That's a good word. Yeah. You know what I mean? A bit of an mm. elemental negative something. Yeah. So I'm happy to tell whichever one of those takes your fancy. Let's, let's hear them both, if that's okay. <laughs> well, let's do the yattering. Okay. Um, and I've kind of stolen that off Stephen King, I think. Or is it... Um, oh, it's another writer. Not Stephen King, not Dean Koontz. There's another horror writer that, that talks about the yattering. Did the books of blood, but it'll come to me later. Um, so we lived in what was a police house in a little village. Um, and we lived there because it was next door to my mum and dad. So when we were raising the kids, it was a really lovely place to, to raise the kids because it was safe. We were working full time. Um, now, we'd known everyone that had lived in that property because my mum and dad had lived next door to it for donkey's years. And there'd been a lot of domestic abuse in that property. There'd been a lot of negativity. So it had stopped being a police station because this village never had any crime. It was like, you know. I don't know how to describe it, but it was this little kind of idyllic village where nothing ever happened. Everyone was in everyone's business, but nothing yeah. ever happened. Um, 
so I knew the property. I knew the couple that had lived there before us and they were quite, you know, they were always throwing parties, but always kind of, it was one of those love-hate relationships. It was, it, was, it was one of those things where there was a lot of high octane tension in this house. So when it came up for rent, I was like, oh, that's a good price because it was about, it was really cheap. And it was a four bedroom property and we had three kids at the time. And so we said, oh, we've got to have that. It's next door to me, mum and dad. It's really cheap. Let's grab it. So, again, no preconceptions about anything. Um, and not long after we moved in, we started to hear, <laughs> it sounds absolutely ridiculous, in the daytime, again, not at night time, like a growling noise around the house. Okay, yeah. I've definitely um, come across that before. But disembodied. Yeah. Um, like the top corner of a room or yeah. the bottom of the bed. Yeah. And with three kids and you're working full time, and I and I just didn't have the time for it. I was like, oh, I'm just I'm not paying attention to this for a while. Well, the kids were getting more and more kind of angsty. Paige in particular, she was a teenage girl at the time. And she did a few odd things where she'd seen someone walking around on the landing. And then one night she'd shouted me to come into a room and I'd walked into the room. It was freezing, absolutely freezing. And it was the middle of summer and it just fell off. And I, again, there was no reason for it to feel off. There was nothing going on. Um, and it felt cold and it felt odd. So we'd had these little weird experiences and the kids were just generally uncomfortable in that house. I'd mentioned mm. a few things. We used to see like someone walking past the window when there wasn't someone walking past the window. Kids didn't like being on their own in there. And this this grumbling noise, this kind of growling noise persisted. Now, one day me and Lee were off work and we were in the house. Again, it was broad daylight. I'm upstairs, Lee's downstairs. So I'm at the top of the stairs folding laundry. Lee's down near the front door. And we heard the growl and I turned around and I said, did you hear that? And he went, because before we'd be kind of in separate. So you can kind of shake it off and go, I'm just, both of us, you heard that, didn't you? Yeah. I lost my temper. And I was like, right, I've had enough of this now. And this is my house. And Mother Bear came out and I was like, I, I, I'm not moving. This is a good property. It's next to my mum and dad's. And I shouted at it and I went, I've had enough. Get out of my house. And we heard, and I'm not joking, we heard footsteps go down the stair. Wow. And I said, get out. And yeah. Lee just opened the door and he said, I, he felt it. And it right. never had, it was so weird. The only thing I can put that down to, it never felt like a haunted. I just felt like something had attached itself to the house because there was so much negativity. Yeah. Now, as a couple, we we were a blended family. So, um, you know, we, we'd come together as a family and there were some kind of challenges going on external to the family. So I often wondered, was something kind of trying to attach itself? Yeah. And I, you know, Mama Bear and me went, no, you know, you're not coming near me and my family. You stay away. And that's why I think I lost my temper. And I think it felt better off it and went on its way. <laughs> no, that's good. I mean, that's the first thing that I do before I do any investigation mm. with, if anyone brings me up and having problems is tell it to go away and leave you alone. Well, and that's my the... taught me that. She was, yeah. I mean, she was the one shouting at the kids in the pub. You know, she always said, oh, well, there, there is no, you know, this is my zone. Yeah. <laughs> she always said, stay out of my zone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's amazing how often it works. But the growling, we we did one in Hull last year. And I, I'll be honest, when I went in, I just thought these people have, there's either some mental health issues or they're just having this on. Yeah. And then I had my back to the door and there was like a, <clears throat> in the top right corner. I was like, okay. Yeah, yeah it's, weird, it, there's something it? happening. Like, yeah. yeah yeah really really odd and it do you know what it felt like as well i said to lee it sounded like you know when you get a little dog that's trying to sound bigger yeah it I've sounded and it, jump up here look oh bless mine i've locked mine out i've got two great big dogs i've got a, an akita uh, with the cross with a, a husky and a german shepherd cross with a husky so they've been banned tonight that's a lot of energy. yeah <laughs> yeah so yeah it felt like a little dog doing yeah. a big growl is what it felt and like trying to scare trying to intimidate yeah yeah, yeah. And that's really interesting. And um, so, um, what's your last story? Well, I can. Which one do you want? I've got the. I've got an interesting one about my mum and dad from back in the sixties, and I've got one about Ethan. Like, well, Where have you got time to do them both? Yeah, if you have. Yeah, well, I was going to be in a meeting <laughs> at seven, but they, they did know I was doing this first, so they, they put it there. Okay, all right. Well, I'll tell you the quick one about my mum and dad. So this was they, they've dated my mum and dad. Bless them, they passed away now, but they were together from being fifteen. So, you know, it was one of those. They got together at school. When they first started dating and they got a car, they used to go driving because obviously this was back in the 60s. If you wanted to have any fun, you had to kind of drive around and find a place for it. Anyway, they're driving home one night and it was very snowy and they see an old lady with a bit of a headscarf on, um, which we'd had to at the time, she looked a bit out of place because she was, 
it didn't seem fitting for the the time but he just thought oh she's just an old lady you know and and yeah. so my dad said oh, i'm gonna pull over because this is this is horrible weather so he said he, she got in the back and he said where do you want to go to love and she said oh i just want to go up the road and then she just went silent and then the whole time my mum said she felt a bit odd she said she, she didn't really want to uncover her face she just sat there in silence and all of a sudden she said to my mum are you a good girl betty now she my mum had not given a name right and my mum went i am and she went Good. And she said, can you stop the car now? And my dad's like, are you sure? No, I know, I'm, I'm fine where I am. She got out. Typical kind of hitchhiker story. They turn around to look where she is. She's gone. But that's not where the story ends. So that right. was just a weird little thing that yeah, they talk yeah. about. A year later, her sister, my auntie Chris, she's married a traveller. And so she's living in this caravan. And she goes into the caravan to do some work. She comes back out. And there's an old lady sat there. And she sat in the chair again with a shawl over her head. And she said, can I come in for a minute, Christine? And she said, I felt obliged to let her in. <laughs> so she came in and she asked the same question. Have you been a good girl? And she said, yeah. She said, can I get you a cup of tea or something? And then when she'd gone, woman had gone. So we never know who that was. I think my mum suspects it may have been a relative of yeah. some description from the past. But we never know to that day who she was. That's strange. Oh, it was <laughs> was it the same part, same road, or different parts of? No, different, totally different, completely different places. Same woman. Yeah. Or they think it's the same woman, same appearance, same questions. Right. Yeah. That's really interesting, and making sure you're behaving. Yeah, she's never called on me. I think I'm a lost cause. So. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> she's decided I'm too much. So well, whoever she was, she's, she's, she's about not to coming. She's like, well, I won't bother. Nah. <laughs> it's pointless asking. Um, yeah, the last one I'll give you. Um, so it's just, again, little anecdotes about Ethan. And, and many parents have this, don't they? The babies kind of talk to people that are not there. Yeah. But with Ethan, it seems to go on for a little bit longer. Um, now, Ethan never met my grandma, Doris, and she was my life, you know. Yeah, bless but love my mum, but my grandma was my kind of, yeah. you know, my, my go-to person. Um, and it was funny because... I struggled to get pregnant with Ethan, but I went and had a reading as well when I was trying to get pregnant with Ethan. And a lady had said to me, oh, your grandma says it's fine. You'll have no problems. A little boy's coming. So that was a bit of an odd one. But then Ethan did arrive. And when he was about two, he went to nursery um, and he's babbling. He's starting to talk. And they had those Fisher Price phones. And the woman at the nursery said to me today, she's always oh, been quite, quite intense with the phone today. He's been talking to someone all day. He's been quite insistent. He's been talking to Doris. So I was like, okay, because that's grandma's name. Yeah. I've never mentioned Doris. She's just grandma. You know? Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay, we go home. And I said to Ethan, I said, all right, if you had a nice day, say, yeah, Doris, Doris said hello. So I got out some pictures. I said, do you know any of these people? Doris. So Amazing. it's just, that, but they, he did that a few times. We'd go places and he'd be quite insistent. He'd seen a lady and we couldn't see the lady. But then the loveliest one was, my dad had, had a dog before Ethan was born called Ben. And Ben used to sleep at the top of the stairs at my mum and dad's. And Ben passed away many, many years before Ethan was born. And then one day, Ethan, again, as a toddler, about two or three, walks up the stairs, starts doing this on the top of the stairs. For those on the podcast, I'm stroking the air like there's a dog there. And I said, what are you doing, Ethan? Ben dog. <laughs> said, okay. <laughs> no, he's grown out of it. If I tell him stories like this now, he looks at me as if I'm an idiot. Right. But he went on until he was about five or six, various little odd things you know just That's these amazing. odd kind of knowings um but then it just kind of went with age and now if i try and talk to him about these things he looks at me like i'm an alien so <laughs> and Dor doris isn't like a a word that you would hear even on mm -hmm. tv or much is it it's quite no, an uncommon it's not. name and time. I, we wouldn't have referred to her as doris yeah um you know i would have referred to her as grandma you know yeah. and i can't recall speaking about my grandma in front of ethan because she'd been gone yeah. 10 years before he was born yeah that's amazing i love that yeah so many times we hear stories about children don't we and there was one in a village near me and this um their daughter kept seeing this this girl and describing her and so they went to the library and did did some research yeah. and a little girl with that very name had died down in the yeah. basement there so yeah i love it they don't know what they shouldn't know do they no so it's yeah. okay for them to just say it yeah yeah <laughs> That's amazing. So th thank you so much for uh, for coming on the show. I'm sorry to have kept you. <laughs> no, it's just brilliant. Thank you so much. Graham, author, poet, playwright, 
historian, genius, artist. Welcome to the 14 News podcast. Hello, good evening. You've got some spooky stories for us. I'm really excited to hear them. Well, it, it, it's one in particular, and it's I, I, I worked in London for a lot of years. And at one point, I was working in the bottom of the World Trade Center. Now, the World Trade Center then was uh, where the Thistle Hotel is, uh, and it's across the road from the uh, Tower of London. And the road that you approach it by is the road that goes across Tower Bridge. And the back of the building backs onto St. Catherine's Dock. Now, St. Catherine's Dock is one of the oldest docks. Virtually, I think it can trace its going back to the Roman times. And, of course, you're next to the Tower of London, mm. which is another major historical site. Yeah. I mean, it was built, It was. I think it was a, it was a second building uh, built by the, Norm, uh, the Normans. Yeah, Bishop Odo built it because he... Based, he built Colchester Castle first and then based uh, the tower on Colchester Castle. Anyway, I digress. I was an AV designer. Now, in those days, AV was slide tape presentations using Kodak SAV, SAV projectors to project images up. And because it was a uh, multi-projector show we had a theatre in there with a permanent rig. I think it was a 36 projector show. And as you're getting nearer and nearer show date, because uh, these things were used, the one that I was actually doing was to launch a new route for British Airways, and it was going to be shown at uh, Gatwick. And it was a 36 projector show. Now, I had my crew, which were the technicians that run the show, uh, they line up 36 projectors onto the, the screens. They run the sound. They do all that. So they're the technical guys. I'm the guy that's in charge of the slides. And halfway through, I mean, it, you always ran out, ran out of time. You were always against the deadline. And we were working there. We'd gone into the theatre about 6 o'clock at night. And this must have been beyond midnight. It, it was pretty damn late. And I suddenly remembered we were some slides short and they were on my light box. Now, the way that building worked was the basement was like an H. You came down to it and you were in the crossbar of the H. You went left and you went into uh, an ad agency. You went the other side and you're into our building. And it was a long strip. We had the theatre at the far end and our art studio was at the opposite end. So I wandered, I wandered down past reception into the art studio, which was on two levels. My desk was on the balcony level. So I'm mucking about on the light box, getting these slides and putting them in order. And I'm suddenly aware behind me, down at, in the bottom layer of the art studio, there's a guy at a desk, a, a drawing board. And I can remember thinking, it was a guy called John's drawing board. I can remember thinking, what the hell is John doing here? His show doesn't go out for a couple of weeks. It, it, you know, he doesn't know need to be doing. And I turned around and looked at him, and it was a bloke in a Victorian frock coat and a top hat. Right. And I looked at him thinking, what the fuck? And still thinking it was John. Because he had he had the same height as this guy, and then suddenly it was dawning on me this couldn't be John because John didn't dress like that at all. And I'm looking at this guy, and the guy's looking at me, and as I'm looking at him, it just totally dissolved in front of me. Just it, it's the only way to describe it. it. Didn't disappear. There was no smoke. There was no mirrors. Mm. It just literally dissolved. Yeah. So. I go back and everything's fine. I, I, I go to the back to, to the theatres of the crew, tell them about it. They all call me a pillar to laugh. Ha, 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 ha. And the next day I went to, because we were so aware of security, because we were handling bloody car launches and we were handling all manner of, you know, sensitive material. Uh, I went to the studio manager and said, what I'd seen and 
John's desk was checked to see if there was any sensitive material on it. And then they called in the security guys. And the security guys admitted that in that building, the lifts went up and down, up and down, most nights. Right. And they would never, ever dare go and investigate. And they were not surprised. Uh, evidently, there were all manner of sightings in that building. Uh, and then when you think about it, you know, you're next to St. Catherine's Dock. It's possibly yeah. one of the most historical sites there is in yeah. London. Yeah. And, and that was it. I never saw it again. Nobody else ever saw it again. But, you know, I know what I saw. And that guy was absolutely, he looked absolutely solid. Yeah. It wasn't wispy. It was just, just like looking at another human being and then just dissolved. Amazing. Interestingly, I'm I'm pretty sure I've heard of a sighting in another building nearby St. Catherine's Dock of exactly the same description. I'll see if I can find out um, and, well, and add it. I'm not even sure if, I mean, the company I used to work for, it was Carabina, which was an American company. I'm not even sure if they're there anymore. But the building backed onto the Thistle Hotel. Mm. Which went down virtually to the water side. Yeah. But at the, at the far side, there was the, uh, because we were all members of uh, St. Catherine's Yacht Club, <laughs> because being an American company, they like to look after us. And that was hilarious. But no, nobody, uh, never heard of another sighting there. But the security guys all said, yeah, that building. Do you think that? when he was looking at you, was he noticing you? Interesting. I looked at him because he was, when I first looked at him, and it's why I thought he was this other artist, other designer, because he was looking at the work on this guy's desk. Yeah. And I thought, oh, that's John. He's looking at the artwork. Blah. And then as I'm looking at it, yes, this figure turned and looked at me. And I wonder, I wonder if in the past there's a guy in Victorian times going, I've just seen this this bloke sat at the desk staring at me and then vanished, wearing <laughs> these very strange clothes. In a red leather jacket with a Clash T-shirt on. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was wearing at the time. But, yeah, it is so strange because he did turn and look at me. And it, it's almost as if... You're, you know when you're aware that somebody's looking at you and they mm. turn around. Yeah. It was exactly like that. That's amazing. And um, did anyone know who it might be? No. No? No. And no, the, the, no, the lift no, going no, up no and down is interesting. At all. I mean, but it was downriver, you know. St Catherine's Dock wasn't a hanging place. That was further down at Wapping and the Wapping Steps and down there back towards the Isle of Dogs. And um, that's an incredible story. Thank you, Graham. And the You've also told me one about a factory in Leeds or what used to be a factory and some singing. Oh, God, yes. That's a brilliant uh, story. Would you be able to tell me that? Yeah, sure. I was researching... Uh, I've always wanted to write a musical, <laughs> uh, despite the fact I'm not musical at all. But I was researching the idea of writing it about the Bambo ladies. Uh, I ended up doing a set of poems about them. Now, when the First World War broke out, Britain was very short of armaments factories. And I believe in 1915, there were plans to build new factories. They built Bambo Armaments Factory inside six months, which included a railway that ran off the main Leeds York line. Uh, and it was up an operation. Now, at some point, and I think it was in 1917, or uh, there was a massive explosion there, and 36 women were killed. Uh, in in just the one explosion, there were another two uh, where I think the second one, three men were killed, and the final one, just one person was killed. But there's not a lot left of it, uh, and it hadn't helped. They built a new road virtually skirting the site, but there's like all sites, there's lots of green lumps and stuff like that. 
and it's covered in brambles. You can still see a bit of concrete posts and remains of it. But we were stood away from where the main site was. And there was myself and a lady there called Yvonne. And Yvonne suddenly turned to me and said, can you hear it? I said, hear what? She said, I can hear singing. And she could hear women singing. And it was more than two or three. Mm. She, could, she reckoned there was about 20 or 30. And they were all singing. And we looked because we had an iPad with us and we looked and we realised we were stood right where the platform was for the railway that went in there. So we came to the conclusion that if we had heard singing or if she had heard, there were women either coming off or going on to shift. Brilliant. They wouldn't sing during shift, but sing at, probably going home. Yeah. For morale, wasn't so, it? And, and the other weird thing is that they were all factory workers and they were experienced factory workers because a lot of them uh, had been had come from York because they used the railway, obviously. And they came from York because they used to work in the Terry's Chocolate Factory in York. Right. And a lot came from South Leeds from the industrial factories down there. But very few came from that area because that area didn't breed factory workers which is why they need a railway line to get people in and out. Yeah. But, yeah, that's what we heard. That's what she heard. I didn't hear a thing. That's interesting. Not- we, we we have some, you know, it's quite common on paranormal investigations for one person to hear something really clearly and other people not, or even yeah. people hearing different things. It's amazing. Yeah. Really strange. Uh, it's I wrote about it because I called it... Uh, I heard the canaries sing because the women were called the canaries. That's right. Because the chemicals they used turned their skin yellow. And also the cure for it was milk. And so the government owned two farms either side of the factory that had dairy herds and they fed them milk. Incredible. There you go. Amazing story. And as a lead support, you're also haunted by uh, the times then we've come and visited you. Don't even go there. <laughs> I'm still haunted about the cup final, 1972. <laughs> and Graham, um, thank you for the stories. But before you go, I think our listeners would be really interested in your books, which are on the Fortune theme. So one of them you've written, which is something I do, which is to make up silly folklore and post about it. Oh, God, you must read that. I, it, When I was ever depressed, I'd sit in the gallery and just make up the most ridiculous things possible. Many, many years ago in London, I was in a folk band, and I got so annoyed with uh, Morris dancers that I, they, they became the, you know, every festival we played, we had to climb onto the stage over hordes of drunken Morris dancers. And to this day, I am not convinced that a pewter tankard is traditional bloody dressing for a, for a Morris dance. Ex- explain what, because a lot of my listenerships are broad. So explain Morris dancing to non British. It's English traditional dancing. Uh, and it is English. It's not British. It's different to Irish. It's different to Scottish country dancing. And it's just blokes that dress up in carrying on the tradition. And traditionally, it had its place a celebration of harvest mm-hmm. or celebration of planting or celebration of just getting pissed, basically. Yeah. <laughs> but it would be an agricultural event. Mm. And they would do this dance, you know, you can say it's a fertility dance, it, 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 sort of going back in time. Uh, I mean, I used to go a lot, and it wasn't so much, well, there were Morris dancers there, but I was born north of Leeds and near a village called Barrack in Elmed that to this day has still got the tallest maypole in uh, Britain. And what's peculiar about it it only goes up once every three years and right. comes down every three years. And when it goes up, a bloke has got to shin right up to the top uh, and put 
what they call the uh, uh, well, put a weather vane on. It's what they actually call the Brotherton Fox because it's the signatory of the local landowner of the 1800s. Right. But it died out. Uh, it died out in about 1800s and then got revived again. Uh, and I can't remember when it was revived in the 20th century at some point. Uh, but <laughs> what is interesting is that I don't believe it's a traditional maypole that celebrates the May dance. I know my ancient history, and Barrick was the centre of the ancient kingdom of Elmit. And Elmit was a Romo-British kingdom. And north of it was Benicia and Deira, which were Saxon and Northumbrian kingdoms. Right. And Edwin of Northumbria, who was Saxon, walked and took over a lot of land in the north of England. And whenever he took over that land, he would plant what they call a Roman tufter in it, which is a description of a maypole down to a fine thing, only about 12 foot high. Right. And I believe that that is a celebration of Edwin taking over the kingdom of Elmet. Right. There yeah. you go. It would certainly align with it, wouldn't it? It certainly does. Apart from the fact that it seems to have grown 300 feet in the mid-trip. <laughs> and t tell us about your book, because there's a there's a story even behind the book, isn't there, of the, the person who's written it? The, oh, the, I... The I pen yes. Name. yes, I came up with a name because I didn't want to be associated <laughs> with it. And so I've claimed that it's in the lost... It's a lost memoir of some idiot researcher that spent all his life going around English pubs, getting drunk and picking up these folks, these folk tales. It sounds exactly what I do, Graham. <laughs> you must read it sometime. It's just called I'm, I'm going to have to. It's available on Amazon. <laughs> so it's called Folk? Exclamation and it, mark. <laughs> and, and, and it's by? It's actually, you know, I can't remember. I think just look up Folk. I'll, put, I'll put a link. Mark. I'll put yeah. a link in that. And you've also written an, an entire series and, and yeah. on, on working uh, on another one. The 13th will be out. It's just been edited and I'll be getting it ready for publication next week. Uh, and that's about an imaginary character called Agnes the Scarborough Witch. And she has adventures with her cat who she goes, uh, she lives in present day Scarborough. But when she goes down the cellar and goes through a door that isn't there, she comes out in the late 1700s, where she's the acknowledged witch of Scarborough. And the cat goes down, and when he comes out in the 1700s, he turns into a six-foot-high ginger-haired ex-highwayman. And they have adventures based on real historical events. And where, where did you get the ideas for this? Where do you think one day you go, I'm going to write a series well, of books based on a witch? No, by profession, I'm a scriptwriter, always yeah. have been for the last 40 years. And in the 90s, before I even dreamt of coming to Scarborough, I was commissioned by an American film company to write the story of John Paul Jones, that if you read English history, is a Scottish pirate. If you read American history, is the founder of the American Navy. Yeah. So I wrote his entire life story, researched it, wrote the whole lot. Uh, an amazing guy. You need to research him. He was brilliant, absolutely. He's the only guy in history that was an admiral in the American Navy. And when the American War of Independence ended, he got bored and wrote to Catherine the Great, and she made him a rear admiral in the Russian Navy, and he fought for her in the Crimea. But anyway, <laughs> one of his battles was in the bay at Scarborough and a battle that stretched between Scarborough and Flamborough. It's known as the Battle of Flamborough. Yeah. And I've, by now, I've, you know, I'm 15 years later, I've moved to Scarborough, I've opened my gallery, and I suddenly realised one day that I look out to sea and go, oh, that's where that battle was. Mm. And Scarborough never celebrates it at all. It, it's almost like hidden history. And so I thought, hang on, why don't we write a story about it? And from absolutely nowhere, 
this bloody witch and her cat came into my head and took over the story. Amazing. Well, of course, his, his ghost is meant to haunt Key Street. Well, yes and no, because the ghost thing, its he never came ashore. Mm. And he didn't die here. He died in the middle of the French Revolution. Uh, nothing to do with the French Revolution. He died of old age and whatever. Mm. But he died in Paris. Yeah. In fact, here's a now if you want a weird connection, get this one. He was buried in that famous French uh, cemetery. And in 19, I think it was 1900 or 1919 or something, the Americans came and dug him up and took him back to America where he was buried there. But that is also the graveyard where Jim Morrison, the lead singer of The Doors, is buried. Right. Jim Morrison's father was the captain of the Bonhomme Richard, which is the ship that John Paul Jones sailed. The name Bonhomme Richard is always the name of the Ameri flagship of the American Navy. Currently, it's an aircraft carrier. Right. Now, Jim Morrison's dad was the captain of that because in the biography, No One Gets Out Air Alive, there is a photograph of the 14-year-old Jim Morrison on the wheel of the Bonhomme Richard. Amazing. So both of them were buried in that cemetery. Well, well, yeah, what a serendipitous link. Absolutely. <laughs> and the history is full of weird stuff like that. Mm. But I, I don't see how he can have a ghost there. No, well, the, this, this local folklore legend goes that he, he was injured and that's where he hid, apparently, because, of course, the Three Mariners was a, a smuggler's oh, yeah. pub. But it was probably um, just a case of claiming a bit of glory from an event that happened nearby for one of the most famous at the time I people in the world. I should imagine because his ship sank off Filey mm. and the, the Americans have been looking for it for years, but it burnt to the waterline. So there's right. could have been damn all left of it. Yeah. And he kidnapped and captured a British warship, HMS Serapis, and that had never, ever been done before or since for that matter. And he sailed that from the coast of Flambra to Holland and then from Holland back to France. Yeah. So he never, ever came ashore. No. Of uh, course, if he, he did, he would have stayed because it's so beautiful in Scarborough. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I mean, it's funny because he didn't even go. He used to sail out of Whitehaven. Right. And he attacked Whitehaven and he sent a load of sailors ashore to burn the town down. But instead of doing that, they went to the pub and got drunk <laughs> and got chased out of town. Uh, he fired some ships in the harbour, but even then he never went ashore. The only time I can trace when he went ashore was when he did a castle in the Solway Firth. Uh, and him and his men marched up to this castle, knocked on the door, asked for the Lord, told he was uh, taking the waters in Bath. Men all muttered, so he asked the servants to bring all the silver of the house down, which they did, and they even emptied the hot coffee pot that was being served at breakfast, and they took it with them. Uh, but the weird thing was... On his deathbed, on his will, he instructed that all that silver to be returned to the lordship and to return to the house. That's interesting. Any any reason why? I think he felt guilty. Right. Really strange. Mm. Uh, but it, it, it sort of, it, it gave a lot of stuff away on his deathbed that uh, he'd plundered in his time. Right. I suppose perhaps he was just knew he was dying and, you know. Make amends. A, yeah. yeah. Who to knows? Go, to go and see St. Peter. But that's how that series of novels came to write. Next thing I know, I've written 13 of the bloody things. Amazing. Yeah. I, <laughs> I need to read them one day. I need a holiday just to sit and read them from start to finish. I know they're really popular. I'll put, the, I'll put the links in um, 
in the show notes so people can go and check them out, Graham. That'd be great. I thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much for joining us. That was brilliant. Absolutely no problem. And I'll uh, catch you later. See you later. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. So, Chelsea, yeah. welcome to the 14 News podcast. Um, you've got a story to tell me about when you were four. Is that right? Yes, that's correct, yeah. Excellent. So tell me what happened. Um, so originally I live in Sheffield um, and I was four and we lived in this house um, and there was uh, two bedrooms together and there was two wardrobes facing each other against the same wall. When I was in one of the bedrooms, I felt very uneasy Um so my mum and dad moved me out of the bedroom and put me in the other room. Right. When when I went in there, it's like again I felt really scared, weirdly, weirdly like something was watching me. Okay. So I like went to bed, and this this voice came and she said, "I don't like girls. I only like boys." She came and sat on my window sill, like she sat on my window sill. She kicked me out of the bed. Right. Um, and she's she went. My name's Claire. Boy, boys are only what I like. I don't like girls. Um, wow. and a few days later, my dad heard some kids like laughing and joking in the bathroom. He went into the bathroom, but there was no one there. Right. Um, he couldn't understand. They were like boys and probably one girl. Wow. Um. My mum used to get scared as well because I call her hair. Used to stand up on the back of her neck when she was in the kitchen. Um, and when, like about a week later, my mum and dad uh, stripped the wallpaper and in black letters it had Claire along the wall. Oh wow! Um, and we cannot understand how it was. What was going on? We don't know the history of the house. Um, but it was just really weird how, you know, I, I knew a name and my mum, mum and dad then saw it. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's crazy because after that, I used to have my teddy bears in your bed and I used to sleep on your floor. So, yeah, and I've al- always remembered that for 28 years. It's no- never left me. That's incredible. So when... Was that like something that suddenly started in the house or was it when you first moved in? It started gradually. Um, my, like I had a cat as well and the cat used to be scared of going upstairs. So we'd never right. thought much of it really. Um, right. And then it just gradually happened. I, I was scared in the bedroom. Yeah. But and it's it interesting because really a four-year-old doesn't feel like they're being watched often. You know, that's quite a strange phenomena to, to sense isn't it so to yeah. feel like you're being watched and wanting to move like people I know kids feel there's stuff in there and going on but the actual sense of being watched is a little different yeah yeah it was really weird because it was like in the wardrobe it was like as if someone was stood there watching me it's always the um, wardrobe isn't it yeah exactly and like I said it was then when we moved the bed uh, when I moved the bedroom Again, it was in the it was in the same place, the wardrobe. It's like she walked through yeah. the wardrobe. That's interesting. Maybe there was a, a door there previously. Um, yeah, maybe. Behind the wardrobes. I don't know what the history of the house is. Um, I just now know that it's only fields. Right. Um, so I don't know whether it was fields before or what. Yeah. And, and what did she look like, this girl? She, she, well, she was a woman. She had like black, black hair. Um, she wore like this blue dress. Um, and she just looked normal. She just looked the color in her. She had color in her face. Right, so weird. solid. And and was it like her? Was it like modern clothing? Uh, I'd say yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like. It's like a nice blue dress. It was like long sleeved. Yeah. 
very yeah, I've never known something like that very big. That's yeah, amazing. Sure. Yeah. And did it did it stop or did you just move? Um it carried on for about three or four weeks. Um like we were still leaving noises and like I was still seeing her. Um and then we actually moved because it was not yeah. It weren't a place we wanted to stay in, yeah. yeah. Um, and obviously, my my dad had my dad had a crash, so we managed to get out. Right. Um. But yeah, right. Can you move it? <laughs> That's amazing. And <clears throat> excuse me, do you know that happen to know like the name of the street, just in case anyone's <laughs> listening and from that area who might be able to um, give us a bit more info? Yeah, it was Wigfield uh, Road in Sheffield. Wigfield Road. So if anyone listening. Uh, it's from Wigfield Road. Get in touch um, if you've experienced this or know any of the history of Claire. That'd be amazing. Well, Chelsea, I can hear you're really busy. Um, so thank you so much for uh, coming on and telling us your story. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.